Good afternoon. It's once again Friday, 5.30 in the p.m., and of course I'm your host for the next 25 minutes of the most interactive television show on Earth, and that is Hotline 21. And it's because you, the viewers, kind of set the pace. You determine what our agenda is, what we talk about, what we listen to, and what we think. Let me just tell you, I've been home all week in Chicago. We had what is called a district work week, and uh, we do that every time there's a holiday. Rather than just taking one day as a holiday, we take the whole week, shut the Congress down, and people go home and spend the week doing what we call district work days. I've had a very informative week. Oh, my God. We've, we've been involved in so many things. We had two town halls this week that were just out of sight. We had one in Forest Park, Illinois, where City Hall was filled to the brim. They just elected themselves a new mayor, uh, the Honorable Rory Hoskins. And so he and the trustees and the commissioners, and we all had a wonderful time on Wednesday night. And then last night, we were in Bellwood, Illinois, with Mayor Andre Harvey and all of the commissioners and all of the trustees. And we even had the superintendent of schools for District 88, I believe it is. And a bunch of kids were there. And so we just had ourselves a good time. And, of course, I've been meeting with people almost all day, every day, and uh, look forward to it. We have an in-studio, well, let me mention before we even do that, uh, an article that we wrote appeared in the Hill magazine newspaper this week, and it's called Putting Families First in Our Foster Care System. It was authored by myself and Representative Jackie Velosky, who is the ranking member of the subcommittee that I chair, which means she's a Republican from Indiana in the South Bend area, and um, she represents Republican thought on the committee, and I represent what is thought to be democratic thought and position on the committee. And we work well together, and I want to thank her for co-authoring this uh, piece that appeared in Hill called Putting Families First in Our Foster Care System. That's a great deal of what we deal with. I know that we had a caller who uh, is trying to get in. I'm going to ask him to hold off for a minute because I'd really like to go straight to our guest and then we'll be open for questions and comments and revelations and thoughts and ideas. But we are delighted to have in the studio with us Dr. Michael Bender, who is an adult an adolescent a psychiatrist. Uh, I have a great deal of affinity for psychiatrists. I used to work for one. I worked for Dr. Kermit T. Mellinger, who was one of six African-American psychiatrists licensed to practice psychiatry and medicine in the city of Chicago back in the early 1970s when I worked for him. He was a pioneer in the methadone maintenance uh, treatment. 
He was a uh, specialist in treating individuals who were addicted to substances. He was on the staff of the Chicago Medical School. He was also on staff of Mount Sinai Hospital, and he was on the staff of the Veterans Administration Hospital, Westside VA, which is now Jesse Brown. And of course, I was always delighted that I had the opportunity to rename the Westside VA and change the name from Westside VA to Jesse Brown VA. So. Psychiatry is a big interest of mine, has been. I used to be a public school counselor back when I worked for the Chicago public school system. And for a brief period of time, I had my own little psychology practice and actually saw clients. I decided that working with individuals was wonderful and great, but I thought that I would venture a little more out into the public arena and decided to give up the couch and the chair for the meeting rooms and all of that kind of stuff. Dr. Bender, we're delighted to have you. And um, I understand that you're going to chat with us about what you consider to be some of the real serious causes of issues and problems that we face every day. Welcome, and please. Thank go you, right Congressman ahead. Davis. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your interest and for your support of medical research. I'm here to represent the Binder Foundation, which is a charitable organization that is dedicated to the enhancement of human life through research and education on disorders of the mind, body, and spirit. With that said, I'm here to talk about what we believe to be at the root of all, yes, believe it or not, all, the most challenging problems that our society is facing today. Not some, but all. All. All right. I'm talking about alcohol and substance abuse talking about domestic violence, child abuse, teen suicide, violence in the streets, violence in the workplace, mass shootings, school truancy and dropout, inability to gain employment, inability to implement job, jobs training skills. On the medical side, obesity, heart disease, cancer, chronic pain, and of course, mental illness. <clears throat> now, we all know that there's been plenty of talk about these problems being related to factors such as bad parenting, lack of education, lack of social support, poor decision making, and mental illness. Now, of course, these things do contribute but the biggest problem is something that has not yet been identified. I think that's why we've been slow to make progress on these issues and why they're actually escalating in our communities. <clears throat> but before I talk about what that theory is, let me say that this theory is so new that it is just beginning to make its way through the medical community. Though it is supported by hundreds of research studies from around the world, one expert in the field said, upon looking at this theory I'm about to present, that it is consistent with almost all the research. Another expert said it should be published in one of the top medical journals. And in fact, in March of this year, it was published in a top international medical journal. <clears throat> now let me ask you, would you say that poverty has anything to do with any of these issues that you kind of laid out as some of the, what we consider to be problems in I, our world. I would say it's a very important 
cause of poverty, and it is what keeps people entrenched in poverty. <clears throat> so, with that said, I would like to say that all of us know that behavior is dictated by interactions between the mind and the brain. And the brain is composed of billions of little electrical cells called neurons. So when we think and feel, those impulses stimulate specific neurons in the brain that fire off signals that cause us to continue to experience those particular thoughts and feelings. Now, imagine if a person were born with a genetic condition in which the neurons inherently overreact. So that every time the neurons anywhere in the brain, anywhere in the psychological or emotional system were stimulated, they would overfire and they would keep on firing. In other words, they would have trouble turning off. That means that every time a person experienced a stressful event, they would overreact. And that would be outside of their control for the most part because the brain would keep reverberating those same thoughts and feelings. So let's take an example to see how this plays out. Little Billy was in, in, raised in a family where this particular gene abnormality was present and he inherited it from his parents. Now, when he was really little, there wasn't too much stress, so it really didn't show up because having this problem is like, if you think of the brain as a beehive in which the neurons are the bees, it's like being born with irritable bees. But as long as no one disturbs the hive, you would never know the difference between the calm bees and the irritable bees. It's only when you start throwing some stones at the hive that you start telling the difference between which kind of bees you have. So that's why this problem has, since antiquity, gone unnoticed and continues to go unnoticed because these people often look very normal until the stress rises in their lives. And when that happens, the whole problem is multiplied. So now little Billy gets into high school. The stresses increase. He has peer pressure. He's maybe playing sports. He is trying to concentrate in school, but he has trouble concentrating because when these neurons are hyperactive, they send too many electrical signals to the mind at once, and it's like having too many people talking at the same time. But he wouldn't know that. He only knows himself. He's never had anybody else's brain. And the people on the outside don't know that because they don't know what's happening inside of him. He looks fine. He looks like he's perfectly physically healthy. And so people start wondering, why doesn't he pay attention? Why doesn't he do his homework? Why is he not listening? And then, remember, he is raised in a home where one or other or both of the parents have the same problem because the genes are inherited from them. So now they overreact to his problems at school, may blow up and get angry at him, say that he's a bad student, he doesn't care, he may lie because he's trying to protect his feelings because he's doing anything he can to relieve that tension and anxiety and stress that is going on in him that other people cannot see. They would not imagine what's going on inside of him. Eventually, the teachers get frustrated with him. He may, become, he may get kicked out of school. Now he goes and finds some friends who at least seem to accept him as he is, offer him something to make him feel better, like maybe some marijuana or some other drugs. That's what they use. <laughs> We've had a lot of conversation in our state today, I'm sure, about marijuana because the Illinois General Assembly has been debating whether or not it's time to uh, make recreational use of marijuana legal. And I'm, I don't know what they've done today or whether they've gotten to a vote on that or what. But I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion. Let me just also 
let our viewers know that our number is 312-738-1060. And they can now join in with us in terms of questions and that kind of thing. But let me ask you one. Could it be that you're leading us towards the realization that one of our big challenges or problems might be that we have not learned how to adequately handle and deal effectively with stress. That feeds directly into this because stress is what triggers the problems in people with hyperactive neurons. But the reason that they have more difficulties than the other people is that their stress is magnified exponentially because of the way their brain reacts to it. This is a problem that has been with us since antiquity. This is not a new problem by any means. It's just a new discovery. And the reason that the two most commonly used and abused drugs throughout all of history have been alcohol and cannabis is because those two drugs calm the brain down. That's why you see people talking so much today about cannabinoids being the wonder drugs. Everybody seems to be jumping on the bandwagon to using these because they're calming the brain down. That's what I'm getting at here. So to show that what I'm talking about isn't just a small contributor to this problem among many other problems. No, this is about 80 to 85 to 90 percent of the problem. This is the elephant in the room. This is by far the largest cause. And let me show you why. Because you will see in these families that are dysfunctional, here and there a survivor. One child among two or three or four who seems to be unscathed, even though they grew up in the same dysfunctional household. And I ask the viewers to think about people you know, people in your families, relatives that you might know or a friend you might know, to look for those survivor individuals. And I'll tell you how they survived. Because they didn't inherit the gene. <clears throat> so, some family's members may have inherited it. That's right. Other family members may not have. That's correct. And so, if you're part of the lucky group or... Mm -hmm. blessed group, a yes. fortunate group, you did not inherit the dysfunctional or the genes that's going to help cause you to be dysfunctional. That's right. And the, these individuals that are survivors are not random. They follow a classic Mendelian Distribution. Remember Mendel and his pea pods? You remember that yeah. from school? Mm -hmm. That's the distribution they follow. And I view, reviewed it in over a hundred families. In fact, every patient that I see in my office now, I get the entire family tree and I look to see carefully what this pattern of distribution is. And I've been studying this problem now for 20 years. And I actually calculated the number of hours that I've been studying it. It's about 50,000. I've spent about 50,000 hours and read over 1,000 research articles to make sure that this is really true. And yes, about 85 to 90 percent of the problem is this. And once we as a society embrace this, and I think it's only a matter of time before we will, once we embrace it, I believe that it's going to transform all the intervention, interventions we've been trying to make for so many years in so many ways. People will start being able to make use of drop job training. People will start being able to behave in the classroom and stop using drugs. Stop using alcohol. So what I'm at here, what I'm, where we're at here at this point is the theory is there. I've observed this phenomenon for 20 years now. What needs to happen next is we need to do a tightly controlled study, clinical study, 
to demonstrate clearly to the entire medical profession that this phenomenon is real and it is reproducible in controlled clinical study. Let me ask you, do you do any lectures or have discussions where people can come and have a greater period of time to interface with you and to dialogue and, and to get in-depth information and inquire and yes. question you? This is the perfect timing for that and I'm very ready to do it. It's the perfect timing because now, after all these years, the research has been completed, the paper has been published, and I'm ready to educate, as I am here tonight, with confidence that we really have a direction here. This is a real, this is the real deal, Congressman Davis. So, would there be a way for individuals who wanted to uh, avail themselves to those opportunities where they could contact you? Absolutely. I'm going to actually leave this. All right. These are my, my contact, the website, and my email address. And I also have a, a reference to the article, which was published at the end of March. All right. And I would love to, once that's completed and the study is completed and uh, the results are in, my next goal is going to be to make an effort to open some clinics in the Chicago area. Chicago is very dear to my heart. I'm a Chicagoan. I grew up on the north side. All right. And I, uh, I know that you came into the office in 1979. That's a very dear year to me because that's when I graduated from high school. And I could tell you, Congressman Davis, Chicago was so good to me and to the youth programs that by the time I was only 17, I had already played football on Soldiers Field, and I had played baseball at Comiskey Park and Wrigley Field. That's what Chicago did for me. All right. So I have something to give back. Since we've got only about three minutes, could you go ahead and give the, our viewers this information so they can Absolutely. jot it down? Absolutely. So my email address is simply my name, M Binder. That's for Michael Binder. So it's M Binder at dr for doctor, no period, michaelbinder.com. mbinder at drmichaelbinder.com. And the website is also my name, mbinder at drmichaelbinder.com. And if anybody's interested in the reference of the article, to get as much detail as you want on this subject, it's got over almost 200 references. It's called the Multi-Circuit Neuronal Hyperexcitability Hypothesis of Psychiatric Disorders. The Multi-Circuit Neuronal Hyperexcitability Hypothesis of Psychiatric Disorders. And so if you want to, you know, get some further information or you want to really find out where you can go and participate in some of these lectures and discussions and some of this information, you can get in touch with Dr. Binder at either one of these uh, addresses and be able, you know, I really wish we had um, at least a couple hours <laughs> to, to talk about this and to explore it and, and, and try and get, I think that knowledge is one of the most valuable parts of the world in which we live. And the more we get, the more we better understand what causes us to be and to act and do the things that we do. And, and so I certainly would look forward to having the opportunity to avail myself of the information and the explorations and 
all of this. I'm afraid our time is just about gone. You got a last word? I so appreciate your support, Congressman Davis. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Well, my daddy used to tell us that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. He used to say you got to drink deep because <laughs> shallow drinking intoxicates the brain. <laughs> and so we look forward to another opportunity to do this. We thank you for taking the time to join us. And I'm going to try to get an opportunity to sit in on one of those discussions to myself. Thank you all so much. It's been a great afternoon. We always appreciate our viewers. And um, next week, I'll just make sure you've got the whole time. I won't have a guest. <laughs> And we'll just do some back and forth, and I'll answer any questions that you will pose and listen to anything you've got to say. Until then, have a great week. Do something good for yourself, and perhaps something even better for somebody else. We'll see you next week.